Hi, everyone. Welcome to my presentation on containers. Um, all right, so I, as I just said, I am monitoring the Whova chat at the moment. Um, it's somewhere right there, so I can kind of see what's going on. Um, there's also a Zoom chat, but ideally use the, the Whova chat um, if there are any questions. Um, if if I, I think that's relevant to where I am, I'll answer it right away. If not, I will answer some questions at the end. I will have, uh, def I'll definitely have some time. I usually run this session around 30, 35 minutes. Um, so I'm going to talk about containers today. Um, out of curiosity, uh, in the chat, do you want to let me know uh, who attended the uh, the talk uh, from uh, Nick's talk, which was just uh, just before mine? Um, did anyone attend that session on uh, Docker file best practices? I don't see anyone answering yet. That's good. That's good. Um, it's actually pretty good because it, it was. It, it turned <laughs> turns out I, I listened to to part of it, um, and it was it was kind of a. This talk is kind of the prequel to to his talk, so <laughs> so so good. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to talk about containers today, and uh, containers there they've been around for for quite a while actually. I think there was like the concept of of containers, the, the concept that is behind containers nowadays, um, has been around since like something like the '70s. Um, but it's only been popularized a few years ago by, especially by Docker, um, about um, eight years ago, I think now. Um, and uh, more and more people use them. Uh, you've probably all heard about them uh, or else, you know, you probably wouldn't be at this session. Uh, but I'm also assuming that you're not using them if you're attending this session. And I'm sure there's a good reason for that. Um, I only started using containers about a year, year and a half ago. And that was because, well, I, I didn't really have the choice. <laughs> I, was, uh, I got a new job. My employer was using them. Um, and, and my job is actually to be a developer advocate. So I had to uh, go ahead and, and talk about containers to people. So I kind of had to dig a little bit into it. But to me, one of the big thing about containers was, that, and, and one of the reasons why I didn't want to use them is that it, it always felt like something that would someone get in my way. As a software developer, I just want to be productive and I don't want any, like all of that tooling, all of those new trending things. It seems like they're just getting in my way of doing my day-to-day -day job. But uh, until I actually had a very good real use case, um, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, um, really, I didn't see any, any good reason to use containers. But ever since that happened, I've, I've started using them more and more. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, this is a brand new machine and I'm, I'm using them all the time. So I, I don't have a lot of things installed. They're pretty much everything runs inside containers. So uh, I'm gonna kind of talk about that today. I'm gonna give you some uh, real, real case, real, real uh, use cases, real world examples that, that you can use that you can bring to your work. Uh, I'm gonna focus mainly on PHP and JavaScript, which are the two languages that I'm, I'm very familiar with. Um, I've, I've started coding um, last millennium actually. <laughs> um, and uh, I did a lot of PHP for many years and then I switched about 10 years ago to JavaScript. So those are, are the languages, the languages of the web and the languages that I'm really familiar with. Uh, so that's what I'm gonna focus on today. If you have any questions relevant to uh, other languages, I'll try to answer, I'll try to do my best. Uh, but even if you're not into those languages, I, I still do believe that there will be some examples and you will see some, some good cases here um, in this presentation that you can bring uh, with you at work on Monday. Good. So uh, why don't I get started with my presentation? Uh, one of the things that bugged me when I first did this presentation was that I had to switch all around with, between PowerPoint and uh, my command line because I wanted to show some, some real, real use cases. And pretty much everything Docker happens in the command line, right? Um, so I ended up building a, um, a framework to uh, have slides that will display in my terminal. So there it is. So containers for software developers. Good. Let me get out of the way uh, so that you can actually see this presentation. So this is what we're going to talk about today, containers for software developers. First, let me introduce myself. Hi, my name is Joel. I work as a developer advocate for Red Hat OpenShift. So OpenShift is a Kubernetes distribution for enterprise uh, that was that is brought to you by Red Hat. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about Kubernetes today. I really want to focus on containers, which uh, is kind of the building block behind Kubernetes. So very important to uh, have a good understanding on containers if you ever want to go into Kubernetes. 
If you're interested in that, you can always reach, uh, reach out to me. Uh, I'm, uh, you can find me very easily on Twitter. Uh, I try to be active there. So that's uh, my handle right there. So Joel with two underscores, Lord. So Joel underscore underscore Lord. It's like a horrible Twitter handle, but uh, whatever, it works. Uh, so if you have any questions on containers, on Kubernetes, uh, anything Red Hat, uh, feel free to reach out. I'll be more than happy to uh, answer your questions or to relay them to the people who might know the answers. Uh, I am based in the Ottawa, Canada area. Uh, very disappointed I could not be in Wisconsin this year. Uh, I was there last year, really, really enjoyed the conference. It was a nice place. Um, I, I really enjoyed that conference. I was hoping to get back this year, but um, it is what it is. Um, <laughs> but soon enough, I guess, uh, hopefully, uh, probably next year, I'll be able to uh, join you in person again. So as I mentioned, Twitter is the best way to reach out to me. Uh, so feel free to uh, give me a shout. Uh, you know, I get really excited whenever I have Twitter. Oh, I got Twitter notifications already. <laughs> so, ooh, uh, good. Uh, so, uh, and while I usually have stickers, uh, I should remove that from my slide decks. Uh, not that it's very useful in today's world, but um, <laughs> if you're ever in Canada and you're, you know, near Ottawa, just come in and say hi and I'll give you some stickers. Okay, so why should we use containers? Uh, there's a few good reasons, but the main reason for using containers, that's probably what the, the one reason that you've heard and, and probably what caught your attention about containers. But it, it, people always talk about how it's, it, it solves that work on my machine kind of issue. Uh, so it's the same environment in production as you will have in your development environment. So really you carry everything around so that you don't have that, that differences into your, your system. As a matter of fact, your production environment is your development environment as long as you're using containers. Uh, it's great, 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 great for onboarding. That is one of the best things that I've seen so far. Um, whenever you wanna, you have a new team member join your team, uh, you know, and, and even if you're, you all work together, but you have this new project that just started, well, you know, the, somebody's probably using, I don't know, node eight or node eight nor, or 10. And because you shouldn't be using eight anymore, but maybe someone's using node 10, he started the project, everything is there. And then you've got somebody new coming into the project and or a new employee and he installs node.js. And then, oops, well, he's on node 14 because that's the newest version, but then he'll start running into issues and, and that doesn't work. So you have to find a way to uh, downgrade to node 14 or to node 10, or you have to get all of your team to upgrade to node 14. You know, you've got all those issues when you're onboarding a project, but when you're using containers, because everything is packaged together, there's there's not, no, no, those issues don't happen anymore. So very, very practical for that. It makes it really quick. If you're using tools like Docker Compose, within a few seconds, actually, uh, your new employee can be onboarded. He has all the run times that he needs for your prod for his project and he's ready to go. It is absolutely amazing and pretty much for the same reason, but for open source contributions. Uh, one of the, the early cases that I had on, on using containers was uh, on, on an actual open source project. And it was, it was a PHP project. So I, I knew I could change the, the tiny little change that I wanted to, to do on that open source project, although it wasn't a framework that I wasn't familiar with. Uh, I also didn't have like all the tooling. I didn't have, um, I didn't have a database. I didn't have a data set. And I was like, ah, oh, come on, this bugs me. Like, I really want to do that little tiny contribution, but you know, I don't want to install everything. I don't want to install, and I don't do PHP anymore, as I mentioned. So I don't want to install Apache. I don't want to, like, I don't know if you've ever installed the Lamb server, but it's, I mean, it's, it's just a lot of work, especially for a tiny little change in an open source project, right? So uh, what I would have probably done, um, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit of shame with that, especially during Hacktoberfest, but you know, what people typically do is just, you know, submit a GitHub issue and say, well, you know, could someone fix this for me, please? Um, and then even if it's a first issue, somebody will pick it up and eventually fix it. But that project in, in particular had Docker Compose installed so I was able to clone the repository, do Docker Compose up, and everything was spun up for me. I had all of the, uh, everything was working. All the application was running uh, inside my container. It also had a database with an initial data set that I could test against. And everything was there like immediately within a few seconds. So I was able to actually do that little change, submit, it, my, submit my PR, and then I was done. And, and it actually uh, got merged in because it was so, so, so easy for me to actually do that pull request. So if you have an open source project, uh, please, please think about containers. It's very, very helpful. 
um, and, and, it, and it definitely encourages people to contribute to your project. For testing, uh, definitely that's probably the case that you've heard. Um, and if you have ever dealt with a manual testing team, uh, I'm talking not about um, you know unit testing here, but uh, manual testing, you probably ran into an issue at some point where somebody gets <laughs> filed a bug and you were like, well, can't reproduce it, not gonna fix it, too bad. And then you get into a fight, right? <laughs> and you end up not fixing it because you know you can't you can't reproduce it. So it really helps with the testing because you really have that same environment once again. So really everything that happens on one environment should happen in the other uh, pretty much all the time. There are a few cases, but hey. Uh, it's also great for unit testing if you're actually doing unit testing or any sort of testing uh, because you're always starting fresh from a new environment every time you start it. So you always reproduce exact, 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 exact same test every time. And if you put in some data into your database, then everything can be removed at the end. Uh, makes it a lot easier to start with a fresh environment each time. So uh, it helps with a lot of things. It won't solve all of your problems. There's a lot of things that people associate with, with uh, containers, uh, networking, DNS routing, um, that doesn't help you at all with that. Um, as a matter of fact, it can get a little bit complicated at times, uh, although there are tools to help you with that such as Docker Compose. Um, oh, I can't remember the, uh, Docker Swarm is the other one I was thinking about. And uh, Kubernetes is, 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 that's pretty much what it does. Scaling, um, people also associated containers with scaling. While it is a step in the right direction and it will definitely help you to scale your application, it is not the only thing. Like you will need something else and some sort of other tooling to help you scale. Uh, if you don't want to start running your own script and reinventing the wheel and, and trying to spin up and down different containers. So uh, you will need Kubernetes or some sort of orchestration platform for that. Uh, but it's definitely, containers are definitely a step in the right direction, but you'll need additional tooling around that. All right, so what is a container? Well, this is pretty much the definition from, um, oh, I, I should have placed a reference. I believe it's from docker.com. But a container is a standard unit of software that packages up code and all of its dependencies. So application runs quickly, reliably from one computing environment to the other. So I've already kind of talked about that. So really you package everything together. So instead of just taking your, um, your source code and shipping that to the rest of your team, really what you're doing is kind of creating like this huge zip file that would not only contain, um, in the case of PHP, not only your, your, your PHP files, but it would also contain an Apache server and, and it would come pre-configured with PHP and like really, it, it, it will have all of those integrated with it. So that's where it gets really, really useful. It's a lightweight standalone executable package of software that includes everything needed to run an application, code, runtime system, tools, system libraries, and settings. So really you package everything and you're, because you're shipping all of that while, things should be reproducible from one environment to the other. All right, it's also a disposable unit. Once it's completed, it destroys itself along with all the other dependencies, uh, which is great because if you're um, testing out different things, you're putting in a bunch of junk into your database, it doesn't matter because everything's gonna be destroyed at the end. Um, it's also something that you need to keep in mind because everything that you put into it will be destroyed at the end. So you kind of have to keep that in mind. But um, but yeah, once you get used to that uh, mindset, then it's, it can be very, very useful. All right, so you might think, well, it's just like a VM, right? Well, no. <laughs> so, so it is kind of familiar in the sense that it's kind of a, a you know self-contained unit, uh, but it's not exactly the same thing. So when you're talking about a VM, you really have your infrastructure. So your either your servers or your laptop or something, and then you have a hypervisor, which um, I'm not sure what a hypervisor is, but it's so cool. It sounds so cool. Like I'm so glad that I have a hypervisor. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's kind of a way to um, that is, or a software that integrates into your uh, your your operating system. And I'm missing the operating system here. So infrastructure operating system, you have a hypervisor that runs on top of your operating system. And the hypervisor is kind of the dispatcher of all the resources. So it, it dedicates a few CPUs to application A, a few CPUs to application B, and so on. And then you, each one of those um, applications will have their own virtual machine. So each virtual machine has its own operating system, then all the different dependencies, and then your source code. So there's a lot of um, overhead to each one of your those VMs. 
When you're talking about containers, you have your infrastructure. So your, um, your laptop, once again, you have your host operating system. If you're using Linux, then uh, basically your containers are simply processes inside your Linux uh, machine. So, uh, so it's really, really simple. It's very, very fast. It's a blazing fast. You can start them and they immediately turn on. Uh, you'll see that in a few seconds again. If you're running a Windows or a Mac or a environment, then you need a tool like the Docker virtual machine, which will create a virtual machine that runs Linux and then they will be executed from there, but it's still a lot faster than having multiple virtual machines. Okay, so where does Docker fit inside of that? So I've been talking about containers mostly. I haven't talked a lot about Docker. Uh, so Docker is just one of the various tools to run containers. So it's used pretty much as the base for the OCI, which is the Open Container Initiative. So as I mentioned, they really popularized and they, they made it easier and more accessible to, to developers to use containers, uh, but they're just one tool to uh, run those containers. Podman is another alternative. If you're running a Linux operating system, then you can definitely use Podman instead, which is a little bit faster um, and it has additional features, but uh, you can essentially, that's, pretty, that's actually what I'm using on my machine and Basically, there's just an Elias that says uh, Podman equals, or Docker equals Podman. So it's the exact same syntax. You can pretty much use it, um, but that's only for a Linux operating system. All right. So I said this talk is going to be about containers in practice, and I've only been talking about theory since the beginning uh, and babbling about other things. But <laughs> so, so let's talk about containers in practice. And if you want to learn more about what is a container exactly and how it works and, and what makes a container so efficient, um, I have a link at the end that, uh, that links back to a uh, blog post by, by Larry Garfield on, uh, what's it called? The Containers of Lie. Great, 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 great post that really describes what it does, where does it come from, how it works, and so on. So if you're interested in that, definitely take a look at this uh, link at the end. Containers in practice is what I'm going to talk about. So the first use case that I had, as I mentioned, uh, was one of my, my friends that came to me and was like, hey, can you help me with this PHP code? And well, I mean, it had been a while since I've used PHP. I don't have anything installed on my machine. Um, and I really want to help my friends when they, they need some help. But, you know, I, I really didn't want to install a, a, <laughs> a LAMP server on my machine. Um, but then I remembered containers. So this is pretty much what I did. So I had um, I had my terminal open and I went and did a Docker um, and I ran something in detach mode. So this is uh, Docker D. Um, then I was able to um, make sure to clean everything up at the end. And then I wanted to map some ports. So map this here. Um, I wanted to mount a volume um, and var HTML. And then I wanted to run PHP 7.1. Probably shouldn't use 7.1 anymore, but <laughs> that's the one I use. Um, and really, we're already starting to have issues. Um, what is that problem here? Uh, <laughs> We're off for quite a start, aren't we? All right, so let's, uh, let's all right. Um, okay, let's just say it should have worked. Uh, why, why, why? That's the fun about live events, right? Ah, oh, I should have recorded and just sent a recording. Um, all right, let's just remove the dash D then. <laughs> oh, okay. Eventually I'll get something to work. Oh, really? Okay. Um, it seems like um, I'm gonna have some issues with Docker today. Hmm. Um, okay, well, um, <laughs> I just said that Docker will solve all of your issues, but now I can't get it to work. So we're off for a good start. Let me try with Podman. Uh, 8080-V. If anybody sees an issue in whatever I'm typing, feel free to let me know. Um, I'll just remove this, try to find my issue here. Oh, I know exactly what I did. All right, all right, all right, we're, we're back, we're back, sorry. Okay, got it. 
docker run is the command that I wanted to. And there it is. All right, so I didn't have the image installed. So now I'm downloading, I'm downloading everything that, I'm, uh, that I need to actually run a Apache server with PHP installed. And there it is, it started, that's it. That's it, that's all it took me. I took 11 seconds and uh, everything is done. So now I can curl, curl localhost 8080. Um, and as you can see, I have my server responding to my uh, messages. So I'm now able to connect to this PHP uh, server or the, this Apache server pre-configured with PHP. And as you can see, I don't have PHP installed on my machine. So really everything is running inside that container. Now, what's really interesting here is that I can actually run this sample, run uh, samples, where was it? Uh, Index.php. I can go right here and change. So this was the last conference that I attended, but let's just change this to uh, hello CWITC. And I can save this and I do a curl again and you can see my changes. So the fact that I'm working inside a container or using a container to serve my files doesn't mean that, um, that I need to kind of work in that container. It doesn't mean that it adds any additional overhead to me. I can directly change my source code and it will still be executed because I've monitored volume here. All right, so I did a lot of things. There was a lot of options uh, and it didn't work initially, but I managed to get it. Whew, was getting sweaty here. <laughs> so everything is working, um, but I went really fast. So let me uh, go through all the steps and everything that I did here. So the first thing that I wanted to do was to do a Docker run. Uh, run is the command that I missed uh, earlier. So Docker run and the name of an image. So Docker run is the command that you will use to start a container. And then you just tell it what image that you want to use. So in this case, I've used uh, PHP 7.1 Apache. Uh, you can find a lot of various uh, uh, images on Docker Hub. So Docker Hub is pretty much the uh, biggest resource that you can find here. Um, so basically, if you want to run pretty much anything, uh, they have an image for it. So if you want to run a Ruby server, you can look for Ruby. Uh, there it is, we have Ruby. Um, and then make sure that it's an official image, ideally, because you wouldn't want someone to start um, uh, you know, mining Bitcoin on your machine. Uh, and then you can take a look and you'll see all the variants and there's like, oh, there's like a Buster and um, Alpine. And if you do Ruby, you might know what those are. Um, <laughs> I'm not very familiar with uh, Ruby, but really that was just to show you know, how you can find very easily uh, official images for just about anything. If you want to run a database, well, Postgres, um, let's say Postgres, well, you'll be able to find, well, an image for the Postgres uh, SQL, and that's an official image once again. So a lot, lot, lot of information, uh, and it's a great resource. It's always very, very well documented. So definitely take a look at Docker Hub if you need to run any sort of image. Now I wanted to run PHP 7.1 Apache. So Apache is the variant. So I said, well, not run a container that has not only the PHP executable on it, but that also has a pre-configured Apache server that I can then use. So that's the image that I wanted to use. Good. Uh, so some of the options that I use, first of all, I've used dash P. So dash P maps a port. So it tells, uh, it tells my operating system that any incoming request to port 8080 on my machine will be automatically mapped to port 80 on the, or inside that container. So it takes care of doing all that redirection. So it does a little bit of networking right there for you, uh, but it really routes the traffic from your local laptop into the container image that you have running. So because I can't run a server on port 80 on my local machine, because I, I would need uh, root access to do that. Um, but then I was able to still map 8080 on my local machine to which on which I have the rights. And I was just redirect everything inside my container on port 80. Now I also monitor the volume. So I'm telling my, my container, take everything that is in this folder on my local machine and map it inside that container to this specific folder. So I took the current working directory and the, the samples directory, a sample app that I had, and I mapped everything into slash var slash ww slash HTML, which is the default folder from which Apache serves its file. So I just redid that redirection. So basically, as far as Apache is concerned, your um, your folder on your local machine is the is slash var slash ww slash HTML, and it's serving files from there. All right, uh, some other useful flags that I've used, dash D, which tells Docker to run in D dash mode. So kind of uh, in the background, uh, dash dash RM removes the container after it stops. So once you start playing with containers, it takes up a lot of disk space. Uh, so you'll have to clean everything from time to time. Might as well take into the habit of using dash dash RM. So it cleans up the uh, image once it's done. 
dash dash name so that you can name containers. So if you start running um, and spinning up and down uh, various containers, you might want to give them a name so that you can easily find them. If not, it gives them a, a random name, um, which is which works for like just the demo that I've just shown. Um, as you can see, it was named, ooh, where was it? It was named like, so that's the name of my container. Um, it kind of works for now for demos, but, um, but it's not very useful if you want to script some things. So to start my container, what I did was docker run dash d dash dash rm dash dash name so that I could give it a name and find it dash v so that I can mount a volume dash p so that I can redirect the traffic and then the image that I wanted to use. Whew. So that's how you run a container um, and you can run container to uh, use various environments. So if I wanted to use um, the exact same one, let me just go back here because it's a little bit faster and I'll do docker ps to see what's running. Um, so F0F is the name of the container. So we'll stop that one. Uh, what was it? F0F. And there you go. So it stopped now. If I wanted to start the exact same example that I had before, but with PHP 7.4 instead, which is a more uh, recent version of PHP, then I can just change that. It's downloading the images from internet. And once it's downloaded and I have a brand new machine, as I told you uh, earlier, so now I have to download everything. But once it's cached, it's blazing fast to actually start it. So now I have my server with 7.4 that is currently running uh, instead of that 7.1 image. So let's stop that again, B34. Um, there you go. Okay, so I run. You can also use uh, different images. You could also use a PHP, just a, an image that just has the, the executable. So no, without the actual uh, Apache server. So containers are not only for web servers. Um, so in this case, I'll, I'll try to run a simple script uh, that uses PHP, um, and the script is called CLI.php. So basically, that script will just read the number of files in a folder and display how many files there are. But you could run you know, anything, any kind of script with PHP. You can also specify a working directory. So instead of using uh, PHP, whoops, where was it? PHP slash app slash CLI, you could also specify a working directory, which would be slash app in this case, and then PHP CLI.php. Uh, so let me just, um, and I'll go back here because I'm, I'm running out of time. I talk way too much. Uh, I have some of those already scripted. Um, so we will run a PHP CLI. Um, so it runs Docker run. Uh, wow, I missed the. There it is. Docker run dash v blah blah blah. So exactly the the one that I've just shown you, and you can see the result was um, error checking path. Um, no such file or directory uh, because it doesn't have that directory. Um, I could call it from here, and from here it should work. If I can find it again, there it is. Oh, really? Scripts. <laughs> I'm having a hard time today with uh, live demos. PHP CLI. There it is. All right. So there were 20 files in that folder. So I was able to run that PHP script and I got the output from it. Good. Uh, if you want to run a Node.js server, it's very similar. So you're going to tell your Docker run to uh, use the image Node 10. And what is the command to execute once the image is started? Execute Node slash app. Uh, so that will start the Express server. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and do script slash Node. Node. What was it? Uh, node server node server.sh. All right, so docker run uh, dash p, so map, mapping some port, uh, dash d, dash dash rm, dash dash name, you've all seen those, dash v, um, and then also told to run um, uh, node 10. And now I can do a curl localhost 3000, and I have hello world, so I have my node.js server up and running. Um, and you saw how fast that was once again. Um, so because I already have the image this time, I didn't have to download the image. So I instantly started the, the image with Node 10 um, and started serving this file. 
All right, so no more worse on my machine. We fixed that issue now, so <laughs> most of the time at least. Uh, sometimes you still get some errors. Yeah, you might have noticed in one of my examples earlier, I had an error, um, and if that's what happened with my friend, right? And then I had this issue, and he said, well, do you have the file C temp log? I was like, ah, really hard-coded path nowadays? We still do that? Uh, so, uh, so that's what happened. But uh, sometimes you have some things in your environment or in, in your application that you want to, uh, sometimes you, you'll want to hard code them or um, kind of uh, things like a log file or things like, um, there's, there's a few examples of that, uh, but you'll use environment variables to uh, start storing those now. So story variables that can ver be specific to your environment. So things like file names. So uh, that file name might change from one environment to the other. So that log file will, will be different on, on my machine than it is from someone who uses a, a Windows-based operating system. Um, the port of your application, there's a good chance that while you're in development, you'll use port 3000 or port 8080. But once you deploy that into a production server, you'll want to use port 80. Uh, the base URL for your API. So if you're testing, you're probably not going to test on the same API than your production server is, or at least you shouldn't. Uh, so, you know, um, so those could be stored in environment variables so that those little things can change from one environment to the other. To specify environment variables to Docker, you use the dash E flag, give it the name of the environment variable and then the value of it. To access those variables, you can use them uh, in PHP by using dollar, uh, dollar sign underscore env, uh, and then the name of the variable, which can just output it in this case, or you could do whatever you want with it. In Node.js, use process.env.the name of the variable. I'm uh, changing uh, environment variables for various scripts. So let me just to give you a Node.js example here, uh, script slash nodeenv.sh. Um, so right here, you will see that, uh, oops, I needed to download an image very quick. So that shouldn't take too long. Actually, that's a little bit longer. There you go. Mm. All right, done. Let's start this again um, as soon as we're done here. All right. Okay, so uh, let me start it again. So now I didn't need to download the images. And you can see that the first command that I entered was docker run dash e, so I specified a name equals Joel. Um, and then I've, I've started my node server or my node script. Uh, and the node script said, hello, Joel from the Node.js application. And then I started another one uh, with the na name equals world. And now I got hello world from the Node.js application. So I'm using the exact same source code, but I'm changing little things uh, thanks to environment variables. Another interesting thing here is that you can see that I've used the version 12 and version 8. Um, so I've used two different versions of Node.js or two different containers um, for, for this example. So you can see how it, it really helps if you need to do a migration. So if you need to move to from Node 8 to Node 14, then you can just use a different image. You're able to test with a new runtime and see what breaks and um, what you need to fix. So that can be very useful. Um, using environment variables can also be used for configuring your uh, containers. So in the case of MySQL, if you want to run a MySQL database, you will need to specify what is the root password, what is the, uh, the user that you'll use, what is the, the password for that user. So all of those can be defined inside environment variable. If you're using MySQL, um, it's a great, a great time to introduce a, a concept that is called the, the entry point in a lot of containers. And a lot of containers will have that, but not all of them. Um, but it's very typical in, in databases, for example. Um, so you have an entry point and every file, every, usually every .sh file that would be in there will be executed automatically. In the case of a database, any .sql file that is in this uh, in this folder will be executed immediately against your database. So that's very useful if you want to see your database. So if you want to uh, provide your open source contributors with a, a sample database immediately, then you can definitely use that statement inside your uh, Docker Compose. All right, so uh, let's see if we can start a MySQL, um, uh, mysql.sh. All right, so I'll start my MySQL 5.7. I should have really thought about downloading those images beforehand, uh, but thankfully it's not too long. Internet is good today. Um, so now I've just started a container with MySQL. Let's see what we have running right now because we're having more and more. Uh, we'll just stop my node. Um, and my MySQL is my MySQL server. 
So uh, one thing that you can do with Docker is use Docker exec um, and you can open up a session in interactive mode. Um, and I'll open up a session on my MySQL server or, or image and I'll run slash bin slash bash, which will open up a bash session inside of my container. So now I actually have, I'm inside my container, as you can see. So I'm now logged in as root. Um, so whatever file system is in, is here is the one in my um, in my container, um, and from here I can do different things like uh, use the MySQL daemon or MySQL um, executable, log in as a user root password root because why not, um, <laughs> and from here I can do uh, show databases and and I, I can actually interact with my MySQL server so I can check what's in there and so on. So uh, good, so I can do that. Um, let me stop this server. Uh, this should take just a few seconds. There it is. Um, and I can also start MySQL, oops, scripts, MySQL, MySQL in it. All right, so I'll, I'll start my MySQL, but this time I'll also seed my database. And here's another cool thing that you can do. Um, scripts slash and my admin. Um, so if you've ever, um, Oh, this one is going to give me a hard time because I'm using Podman now. Mm, I'm not sure I'll be able to actually run it. Um, not without a, a few changes into my configuration, but you could you could also start a uh, PHP MyAdmin server and actually interact with PHP MyAdmin uh, with your MySQL databases. Uh, but now that I've used the um, now that I've used my seeded database, if I do a Docker exec once again. I can run MySQL um, U root, P root. And now I can do show databases and show data bases. There we go. You can see that I now have a database called presentation. I can do use presentation. Um, and yeah, and I, and I can, from here, I can do select star from conferences. Uh, and so on. So I can really interact with my um, with my database, and uh, you can see how that was uh, preceded. Uh, so that's very useful for sharing a uh, sample database with the rest of your team. All right, but there's more than a CLI. Uh, if you've attended uh, the next session just before mine, this is what he talked about. He talked about Docker files. Uh, so the Docker file provides you with the same options as the command line. It's a standardized set of commands that you can use to build your own images for sharing. So you, it, it builds on stacks that can be shared. A Docker file for a PHP project would start from a base. So you always start from a base image. Uh, so I'm starting from PHP 7.1, the one that I've used before. Uh, you can expose different ports. Expose uh, the, the port 80 is already exposed by default by this image. Um, and then you just copy your files over. So you're taking all of your source code from your local machine and dump that inside, uh, inside your container. So uh, for a Node.js project, you would have something similar from Node 10. Uh, expose your port. In this case, you need to expose them. Copy all of your source code, change your working directory, run npm install, and run npm start to actually start that web server. Uh, so there are ways to optimize this. I'm going to skip on that for now. Uh, if you're interested, like I said, there was this session just before that really went into the details. Uh, so you can take a look, um, and I'll focus on uh, the rest of the thing that I have to show you. So you can compile your own image, basically. A Docker build will create that whole image, package everything together so that you can share that with your team. Um, and then once you're, you have your images, you share them on registries. Uh, so you will also need to give them a name by using dash T, so a tag. Uh, your container might be running as root. More detail on that in a link at the end if you're interested, uh, but just something, uh, some, some servers won't let you push an image that runs as root, so something to keep in mind. Uh, so Docker build builds a full custom image. They can be shared on registries um, and the image is ready to share with your team. So to share, you can use public or private registries. So it's very similar to sharing source code on a, a GitHub repo or a Git repo. Uh, Docker Hub is one of the most popular one. I've already showed you this one. Uh, Quay, if you want to host your own registry, you can use Quay, it's an open source project. And if you're already hosting on Google, Azure, IBM, um, just, just use their own internal registry. It'll be much faster. So Docker push to push your image. So uh, name of the server slash your username slash uh, the name of the image and Docker pull to pull an image from the registries. 
More useful commands, docker ps to list the running containers. I've shown that earlier. Um, docker stop to stop a container from running, docker rm to remove it, docker tag to rename your containers. All right, uh, once you start playing with, um, with containers, one thing to know is that they pretty much never run like you want them to. Uh, so to help you, you can do docker logs to see what's going on. So the name of the container then, uh, docker logs f to see them in real time. Uh, Docker exec, which I've used to, uh, to kind of log into that container. So I was able to see what's, what was in my database and try to debug if there was any issue there or simply run a command inside on your, uh, on your container. So in this case, I'm just running an LS to see what are the files that are on that server. Docker CP will let you copy files either uh, from the container into your local machine or from the local machine into your container. So by using uh, the colon, you'll specify. So in this case, it's copying from container my PHP and the configuration file from Apache into my local folder, or, or I can copy from my local folder into the container. So Docker logs, Docker exec, Docker CP. To run multiple containers, so say you have a PHP my admin and a um, MySQL database, so I should definitely update that. Uh, you can use things like Docker Compose. So Docker Compose uses YAML files so that you can really specify all the containers that you have running. Um, in this case, you can see that I'm running uh, Docker Compose version three. I have the services DB, which is a MySQL image. And then I have the uh, service web, which is which uses a, a PHP 7.1 Apache. Uh, and it depends on the other database. So it will create the networking between the two of them. And what's, what's really nice once you have your Docker Compose is that you can use Docker Compose up and it will automatically fetch all of those images and start everything. So that's the open source project that I've talked about earlier. That's what they were using. So I was able to run Docker Compose up and immediately it came with uh, Apache, PHP, uh, a MySQL database preceded with uh, some sample data. So I had everything out of the box and I was immediately able to contribute. So should you use containers? Well, for your day-to-day -day development, definitely, yes, I think so. Um, it's a tool that doesn't get in your way as I initially thought, but can actually help you a lot in your day-to-day -day development life. Uh, for testing purposes, definitely, it's a definite yes. Uh, it can really, really help to uh, test various things. It gives you the fact that it uh, restarts everything from scratch every time, gives you a fresh start every single time that you start testing so you don't get into those issues um, because you've tested earlier and you already have some stuff in your database, or you also don't run into your, your different environments that you have with your testing team. Um, and should you use them for open source projects? Yes, 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 please use them for open source projects. Uh, as a matter of fact, I love open source. I really, really love open source. Um, you know, I, I work for an open source company. Um, and if you ever have an open source project and you need help to containerize that project to get more contributors, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, uh, Joel underscore underscore Lord. I'll be more than happy to give you a hand uh, to help you to get that environment containerized so that you can get more contributors and make it easier for them to help you on that project. So this is all I had. Uh, I'm running very short on time. I really thought I would <laughs> go faster. I'm terribly sorry about that. Uh, so we still have about two or three minutes for questions. Um, in the meantime, if for more information, easy URL to slash containers, you will find a few links. I've talked about a few of the blogs that are there. If you want my slide deck, it will be available there as well. Uh, of course, uh, it's not a PowerPoint. That's a little bit trickier to share, but it is available as a container. So you can do a Docker pull and get a copy of my slides. Uh, and if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out on Twitter, Joel underscore underscore Lord. Thank you.